Welcome to today's webinar brought to you by Zaloni Click and Data Kitchen. I'm Stephen Fagg, Director of Database Trends and Applications in Unisphere Research. I will be your host for today's broadcast. Our presentation today is titled Unlocking the Power of Data Ops. Before we begin, I want to explain how you can be a part of this broadcast. There will be a question and answer session. If you have a question during the presentation, just type it into the question box provided and click on the submit button. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible, but if your question has not been selected during the show, you will receive an email response. Plus, if you would like a copy of the presentation, you can download a PDF from the handouts tab on the console once the event is archived. And just for participating in today's event, you could win a $100 American Express gift card. Now, to introduce our speakers for today, we have Susan Cook, CEO of Zaloni, Dan Potter, VP of Product Marketing at Click, and Chris Berg, a CEO of Data Kitchen. Now I'm going to pass the event over to Suzanne. Thank you, Stephen. Hello, and uh, welcome everyone to Unlocking the Power of Data Ops. I am delighted to be here with you today. So what I will talk about is just a quick overview and introduce you to Zaloni, but mostly on the topic of data ops. And I'll try to help define it as best as I can from a process perspective, a technology perspective, and then even more importantly from a business perspective. And then I'll let my two great colleagues um, add on uh, from their perspectives as well. All right, so first, who is Zaloni? We're a software company. We're based in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina. We help companies reduce this incredibly challenging thing called data sprawl. And we try to help them gain visibility and control into the entirety of their data supply chain. And that, that may be not a term that you've heard of before, but at Zaloni, we think of data as this golden asset almost um, like a product. You have to get supplies, you have to design a product, you have to build a product, you have to deliver a product, and you have to make sure it gets into the hands of the consumer in a, a safe and reliable way. So that's basically a supply chain. So we help you manage and govern that supply chain for this most important critical competitive differentiating product called your data. Now, some of our customers, we focus on really, really, really big global companies who have tons and tons of data, tons and tons of sources of data, plus uh, regulatory concerns about their data. So in thin services like TIA, Nuveen, Toronto Stock Exchange, and Pharma, LabCorp, or Alexion, Intelco, Do Telco and the Emirates, Tigo in Latin America, uh, people who handle other people's data like PwC and KPMG. So those are the types of customers that we serve. Uh, we partner extensively. As you know, the data landscape is huge and growing every single day. The innovation and I'm, I'm scared to date myself here, but I've been in it for multiple decades. Um, it, there's never been a more exciting time with more innovation occurring in the data and analytics space than right now. So we partner extensively with Azure AWS, uh, MongoDB, Snowflake, Databricks. Uh, you get the idea. In terms of uh, kind of where we play, I, I feel so blessed and so fortunate. Uh, we've been recognized uh, as uh, one of the top three data pipeline vendors by Dresner. One of our customers, the, the Nuveen, won the CIO 100 Innovation Award along with us for building a brand new responsible investment platform, uh, which is all about data, quite honestly. Uh, CRN 100, so lots of good stuff uh, and recognition. So we're really proud of that. All right, let's dive in and talk about data ops, the topic of the day. So first, I like to talk about it from a process perspective. And as we talk about anything, there's process, there's people, there's technology, 
Um, there's all sorts of assets that fit into any kind of a, of a business process. So we love this diagram of an infinite loop. And, um, I, you know, I'm not uh, ashamed to say, you know, we stole this loop concept from other ops concepts. Um, this paradigm, for example, of DevOps, agile, iterative, responsive, um, and, and it being an endless loop, uh, that same paradigm now applies to data. So on one side is the responsibilities and the capabilities of data engineers, data stewards, uh, the, the technologists, if you will. And on the other side of this loop are the consumers or recipients of data, whether it's being its analysts, its, its executives, maybe it's even um, AI or ML jobs. They're, that's a recipient of data. So on one side, you're doing things like data quality, profiling, classifying data, tracking the lineage and the history, building out the metadata, the technical metadata, the operational metadata, so that those consumers on the other side of the loop know what they're shopping for and can actually get that, what we call that Amazon-like experience. When you're shopping for a product, certainly you want to know all the characteristics of that product. You want to know all the fields. You want to know how recent is it, how clean is it. You also want to know that Stephen used this data for his marketing campaign, and Stephen's a pretty smart dude. So if he's using this data, well, then it probably makes sense for me to use it too. So that collaborative, operational, and communication type metadata is equally important when these end users or consumers are trying to figure out what data they should use, how do they get to it, um, how they, can they enrich it, uh, combine it, or augment it with other data sources for the sole purpose that they, on their own, self-sufficiently, can provision that data into whatever sandbox or place where they're going to use it for some analytic function. So that's data ops from a process standpoint. From a technology standpoint, Zaloni's software is a product called Arena. And Arena is one single unified data ops platform. And when we talk about the functions, the technical functions of our platform, we divide it into three buckets, if you will. So the first thing is just kind of knowing your data. We call that cataloging. So as we are moving data into whatever environment, the raw zone, the refined zone, the trusted zone, uh, you know, your operational data store, whatever it is, um, you are inventorying, cataloging, tracking that data, understanding its lineage and its history. Where did it come from? Um, we're also, as data is coming in, we're understanding what kind of data it is. So you would handle a telephone number differently than you would handle, for example, a social security number or a credit card number. Then you would handle, for example, a healthcare diagnosis code. So different types of data needs to be profiled, classified, categorized, depending on what it is, because when we go to the next bucket of capabilities, which is control and governance, you got to know how to handle specific types of data differently. So when we talk about the control bucket and, and governance, obviously we want to ensure that the data is of the highest quality, or if not, that it gets handled appropriately. Maybe you know you got to generate a, a service now ticket for somebody to go fix it, or maybe you just need to run it through uh, a different cleansing routine or something like that. Also, let's say we had profiled data as a credit card number. Well, then that has to be obfuscated or masked or encrypted in some form or fashion. Or if it's an address, we don't necessarily want uh, that to be visualized. So uh, we've got to handle it a certain way. And then 
uh, we're tracking lineage so that in that last bucket, someone can, who needs to consume data can shop for it, enrich, collaborate on it, and then on their own independently provision that data. Let's say they want to put it in Snowflake on AWS or um, uh, Mongo on Google or wherever their ultimate place is where they want to run their, uh, do their jobs. We've got to be able to put that data there, but in a safe way. So let's say that data steward says, you know what, Stephen, you're a smart dude, but I, I don't really want you running up AWS costs for months and months and months recklessly. So as a data steward, I'm only going to give you a 30-day lease on that data, and then we'll blow up that environment. So the whole thing about data ops is not just all of these functions, it's also the automation and the control along with it. So when you're talking about data ops, this governance capability is absolutely essential. So not just access and security and auditability, but we firmly believe that those functions of a, of a data steward, if you will, and I'm using that term as that person that kind of is between the data engineers and the ultimate consumers. Sometimes they fall in IT, sometimes they fall in the line of business. But those who ultimately have stewardship of the data, we want to enable them to automate as much as possible. If you think about all the manual machinations that data goes through, um, you can't have that. You've got to keep it safe and governed. So the more you can automate, the more that you can uh, keep this environment safe, auditable, and controlled, which is the whole objective of data ops is not to control it so that those end users are constrained and they can't do their jobs and they get frustrated. Um, that it's so locked down, but when you can automate as much as possible, it keeps them safe from doing something that could do them harm or, or get a bad business outcome. And, and that is the final goal of governance throughout data ops is if those consumers of data truly understand that the data has been handled with the utmost care and it's been controlled, and there's a lot of human intervention that has been removed, then they have confidence in the data. And that's what the true goal is. So from a business perspective, what does this look like? What are some of the most common use cases that have truly benefited from an enterprise data ops strategy? The first one is just unifying data and modernizing data. You hear the term digital transformation in every industry and in every business. I would argue the key enabler of digital transformation is modernized, unified, well-managed data. And another key use case is customer 360, or sometimes you'll hear golden customer records. So you can cross-sell, upsell, do loyalty campaigns. So that's, that is one of our most common use cases right now, as a matter of fact. Another one is new types of revenue, data products. If you uh, sell information for a living, obviously the data is the key enabler of those types of products. I've talked at length about standardizing governance, but when you have concerns around GDPR or CCPA or HIPAA, you know, whatever regulatory or compliance issue that you have to address, obviously data ops is a key uh, enabler, and uh, I would argue it's essential in order to do that. And then finally, data marketplaces. Uh, I think mean, Snowflake, AWS are, are talking about data marketplaces at length. And, and it's basically rec a recognition that data is becoming the product. And as it, with any product, there is a marketplace, there is a shopping experience that occurs along with that. And I think that data ops is essential to enabling any type of a marketplace experience. 
All right. So that's just a quick overview of data ops from a process perspective, a technology perspective, and then most importantly, a business value, business use case perspective. So again, I'm uh, Susan Cook with Zaloni. We certainly would love to help you on this journey because that's exactly what it is. It's a uh, not a big bang, it's not a one and done, it goes on and on forever. It's a discipline, it's a methodology, it's a process. So we would love to help you with it. So I will turn it back over to my friend Stephen and uh, thanks. Thank you, Susan. At this point, I'd like to introduce our next speaker today, Dan Potter, VP of Product Marketing at Click. Hey, thank you, Stephen. And Susan, thank you. Great presentation. Uh, you touched upon a number of things that are really critical around data ops and automation, governance, the role of the catalog. I'm going to build upon uh, some of that. And, uh, and let me just step back for a moment. It was almost exactly a year ago, uh, Chris Berg and I were delivering a, a data ops presentation for a DBTA. Uh, you'll hear from Chris in just a moment. Uh, but if you think about how data ops has changed over the last 12 months, right? It's been a crazy 12 months globally. And data ops and the ability to deliver the right data to the right people and, and make that data drive the insights uh, that will help organizations, it's never been more important than over the last 12 months. Just think about you know, supply chain, uh, the speed at which uh, having good information, good insights, and the ability to take action on that information are absolutely essential. So I think it's uh, you know, revisiting data ops a, a, a year later, um, I'm going to reflect on kind of how it's changed and, and some of the things that are most important as you're thinking about a data ops strategy, what are the key considerations? So I'm going to talk less about you know, products and, and what Click provides, but more about the things that you should be thinking about. Uh, because you, you can't buy data ops. Data ops is something that you do. It's not something that you buy. And there's lots of technologies to help get you there. But the more important thing is, is to understand, you know, what's the desired end state and how does data ops help get you there? Um, just a, uh, a quick commercial about Click, uh, Click Data Integration. You might know Click as one of the leading analytics providers. You might not know that Click Data Integration is the fastest growing provider of data integration for the last two years, according to the Gartner Group. Um, we've done some really innovative things with our partners like Microsoft and Snowflake, uh, recognized as Partner of the Year by both. Um, our focus is on taking a, a, an, an agnostic uh, approach to building out automated analytic data pipelines, helping people unlock raw data, move it in real time, create analytics ready data sets, provide a catalog and governance uh, to help organizations really hit that digital transformation and do it in a modern uh, platform and from a modern approach with data ops. So let's talk about what organizations are, are looking to do. You know, from our perspective, you know, you've got data managers and these are traditional data engineering folks and data consumers on the other side. You know, the, the traditional approach has been more of a waterfall approach. The data consumer says, hey, you know, I need you to add some data into the warehouse. I'm looking to get some insights on this information. Uh, they lob their request over to the IT side of the house. There's a long design and coding. Uh, there's a testing phase. There's a deployment phase. And by the time six months rolls around and, and the data consumer finally gets a hold of the data, it may be the wrong data. And usually it is. Uh, what the data consumers need, they need much faster cycles. They need more real-time data. They need those insights faster. And they need those data pipelines to be resilient. If something changes on the source side, you can't change. I, I still need those insights and those analytic, uh, uh, that analytic data set. So be resilient to, to those changes. The challenge that we have is, is that the traditional way of delivering these pipelines Again, long cycles, it's batch oriented. There's a window of time by which the data can be pulled from those core transactional systems. Those windows are shrinking as companies are processing data 24-7 you know, now. The way that they've done it historically is, is through brittle ETL scripts, things like Informatica and Talent and traditional approaches. It's just, it, it hasn't worked. And 
you know, what's really required to achieve this digital transformation, you need to move to a more automated approach and a much more agile methodology, right, where the data consumers are getting the data in a more iterative style faster. Uh, the data is being delivered in real time. Uh, and what really makes this come true is automation. Um, so the whole goal of data ops is to, is to accelerate, is to shrink the time by which the data consumer gets the data and the insights that they need to do their job better. But again, you, know, you can't buy data ops. It's, it's something that you do, right? It's, it is about people, process, and technology, and Susan talked about that. Uh, having said that, you know, when you're going to make technology acquisition, you need to have it in the context of data ops and say, okay, what is the right technology that I should be procuring going forward that will help support the key data ops principles? And again, the whole goal here is reducing the amount of time that it takes to get the right data uh, into the hands of the business users. So let's talk a little bit about kind of how the world has changed, particularly over the last 12 to 24 months. You know, the, the big driver here, it's modern analytics in the cloud, right? Modern analytics, things like artificial intelligence and machine learning, uh, the Internet of Things, particularly on the industrial side, large amounts of, of data, uh, structured and unstructured data, predictive uh, and preventative analytics applications uh, to try to help augment the human intervention, uh, more real-time analytics like fraud detection, so these are some of the drivers from an analytics perspective, but really the, the big thing from a data architecture perspective is the cloud, right? Everyone is moving data to the cloud. It used to be only a few years ago uh, when you heard from organizations that would say, you know, we've got regulatory concerns, we've got uh, corporate policy concerns about moving data to the cloud. By and large, that's gone. Uh, organizations are rapidly moving to the cloud. They're looking for greater cost advantage, greater elasticity, greater scale. Um, and the, the kinds of, of data architectures that they're building are a mix of cloud data warehouses, so new uh, cloud native warehouses like Snowflake and Synapse and BigQuery. Uh, they're looking at building out data lakes, how to take advantage of the low cost um, cloud storage so they can build out repositories in a data lake that either feeds the warehouse or in and of itself is the analytic repository. Um, streaming infrastructures like Kafka are having a major impact on how people are thinking about unlocking data, building a platform not only to move the data in real time, uh, but also to persist that data and to be able to, uh, be able to identify things like a pattern, like a fraud pattern and to be able to understand that really quickly and go back and look at the historic context to make a stronger decision faster. So all of this is driving the, the need for modern styles of integration. And this is where the rubber meets the road for data ops. Again, you, know, you can't buy data ops, but I'm gonna give you five things to think about as you're evolving your technology and your approach uh, to data and that data delivery to the business consumer. Uh, with regards to, to integration. And we'll knock off these five uh, in this order. First, it's the continuous flow of data. And this may be one of the most uh, important because, again, using the example uh, over the last year of supply chain, right? Uh, you can't afford to wait till overnight or in some cases you know, the next week to make some of these decisions about supply chain. You need to have that visibility very quickly. In order to do that, you need to be able to identify changes that are happening in your business as they happen and move those changed data in real time uh, for insight and action. The way that you do that, or one way to do that, is through a technology called change data capture. And this is really the reason why, why Click has been growing so quickly in the data integration space uh, and the reason why Gartner sees that the um, that the traditional style of, of bulk data movement is really giving way to change data capture uh, is because not only is it deliver this data in real time faster, uh, but if you do it in a style where you are um, looking at the transaction logs of these big transactional systems, maybe a mainframe, maybe an SAP application, could be uh, a big Oracle Fusion application, uh, you're detecting the changes to the data, so an update or a change in inventory, and we're moving that data in real time to where it's needed. And more and more, it's to the cloud. Uh, 
Uh, and what makes these sending these incremental changes so efficient is that I'm just sending the deltas, the changes over a wide area network into the cloud. So there's lots of benefits to doing this continuous uh, data movement and continuous data feeds. Um, and this is one of the core tenets of data ops, you know, continuous data integration, continuous testing, continuous delivery. The second requirement as we see it is to have a universal approach, right? One of the challenges that organizations are faced with is that you have lots of different technology. You've got all kinds of different data sources and databases. You've got a whole wide range of emerging uh, targets. You know, think of what's happened over the last 10 years in terms of uh, targets for the data. It may have been on-prem Hadoop. Uh, now it's cloud Hadoop in addition to Kafka, in addition to you know, cloud data warehouses and, and object stores. Um, you need to be able to unlock all of the data within your organization and to deliver it where it's needed. Uh, so to have a solution that will do, you know, a, a universal approach, any source in any system. Let me give an example of kind of how it, it should work in an ideal solution. You are generating change data streams from those back, uh, those back office systems. They may be on-prem, they may be in the cloud. So again, this is where change data capture comes in. I'm generating the changes, I'm delivering them where it's needed, and again, I'm creating analytics ready data sets. It may be a pure replica of that data it's going from one database to another cloud database. It may be to a data warehouse where, uh, you know, I may be moving five different sources of, of, uh, of data into Snowflake and I need to be able to do that very quickly. Uh, and it may be to a data lake. So again, this universal approach, unlocking sources, delivering to any target that's required in a very efficient manner. You know, automation, uh, Susan mentioned this, and, and it's absolutely essential. You know, if you think about where the data management uh, architectures and how they've evolved, uh, we've really gone from on-prem data warehouses and data repositories and, and operational data stores and historic data stores. Now they're, it's in the cloud. Uh, and it may be a mix of things, data lakes, cloud data warehouses, a uh, mix of on-prem, uh, evolving architectures like Lakehouse, uh, kind of combining the best of data lakes uh, and uh, cloud data warehouses. We are in a continuous state of evolution. And that's one of the challenges that the data engineering team is faced with when they're thinking about data ops. How do I build for change? Uh, because you want to be able to have the agility to take advantage of these new emerging technologies and approaches, uh, but you can't afford to have, again, that brittle last generation approach to data integration. And that's where agility comes in. Um, on the agility side, you, know, you, you need to recognize that not everything's gonna be in the cloud. Uh, certainly not everything's gonna be on-prem. So you need to be able to run processes uh, on both. Uh, in the best of both worlds, you've got a hybrid approach where you've got a secure and highly performant data pipe between your on-prem core transactional applications uh, and replicas of that data into the cloud. Uh, you need to take a, a different approach to how you're building and managing data lakes and data warehouses. Um, and this is uh, an area that if you haven't looked into it, you should. Uh, data warehouse automation is changing the way organizations are building and managing cloud data warehouses, right? Gone are the days when you, you can afford to have teams of ETL scripters uh, building and managing the warehouse and, and business users waiting months for data to be added. The new approach to this, it's model driven. You define the data warehouse model that you want. The code is automatically generated and pushed down uh, to the server like Snowflake or Synapse or BigQuery for execution. Um, it's resilient as data sources changes, as schema changes on the back end, uh, it's resilient to that change. So it handles the data drift in an automated fashion. Uh, and again, it's built, for, it's built for the future, what we call architectures in motion. Right? There's certainly data in motion within organizations, but these data architectures, again, they're constantly evolving. So you need to build uh, for the future and you need to think about uh, not just tomorrow's requirements, but how do I have this built-in agility so that I can take advantage of, of the next generation of technology. Uh, the final requirement as we see it, and, and this may be the most important, because you can build awesome data pipelines, you can build a great warehouse or, or data lake, 
Uh, but if the business consumer can't find it, and if they can't trust it, uh, then it's all for naught. Uh, and this is where catalog plays a really important role. And, and I agree with Susan here that that it does. It's a it's a linchpin. It kind of sits between the data engineering team uh, and the data consumers. Um, and this is really where, from a business user, I want to be able to go in and find the data. I need to understand it. Where did it come from? Who modified it? How it was it was modified? Um, and importantly, I, I, once, I, once I understand it and I trust it, then I need to do something with that data, right? And this is where provisioning becomes important. Provisioning means I can take this data uh, and I can bring it into an analytics tool of choice. So obviously we're Click and we can take this data and move it directly into ClickSense for instant insights. You can also move this data directly into Tableau and Power BI and data science tools. Right, so we recognize that you know you need to be open and agnostic to do this right. To do data ops, you're going to be in and around all different kinds of technology uh, within an enterprise, and you need to be open and you need to embrace that. And, and again, that's where, from a catalog perspective, it, it all comes together. You need to make sure that the data that's coming in is of, of great quality. It's understood, but you have business users who can find it and take action and generate the insights and. You know, again, this is the, the last mile. This is where the rubber meets the road. So I, I hope this has given you some, some ideas and things to think about in terms of, of how, I, how we see the key requirements for data ops evolving. Again, um, there's no one technology, including Click, uh, that, that will get you there. You need to think about the people, the process, and the technology. Uh, there's been some recent uh, research around people and process. Uh, at the Gartner Data and Analytics event last week. If you're a Gartner subscriber, there's some great new data uh, that they've uh, published there on the people and process side. But again, you know, we're here to help. Uh, we encourage you to go to click.com. You'll find some great resources there uh, around data ops, and we would be happy to engage with you to help you understand, you know, what are the right steps in your journey towards becoming much more efficient and agile in delivering the right data to business users. So thank you, Stephen, over to you. Thank you very much, Dan. At this point, I'd like to introduce our final speaker for today. Last but certainly not least, we have Chris Berg, a CEO of Data Kitchen. All right, <clears throat> thank you. Happy to join. So we're gonna do something a bit different. So um, instead of talking about our product or the market, we're gonna have a little story time. And that picture, the little blonde kid there, is actually my son. Um, and uh, it actually starts when he was about that age, and he's just graduating from college this year. And, and uh, just as a background, the first story I'm going to tell is kind of my life story. Um, and I know you're going to be really excited to hear about that. But the first part of my career, I spent kind of writing a lot of software. So um, 15 years at companies like NASA and MIT Lincoln Laboratory and Microsoft and startups, and I managed teams. And man, I thought I was super cool software guy. And then about 2005, when uh, Jasper was that age, I thought, well, maybe I should go and um, do this data and analytic things, and it'll be much easier, won't it? I'm a big software guy. And you know what? It turned out it wasn't. It was actually much harder. And like as an example, in 2005 to eight, like I, my kids were playing soccer, and I'd have to go slink off, and my wife would give me dirty looks, um, saying, you know, we had a break in the build. I got to go figure out. I got to go home and write some code and fix it or talk, get someone because uh, I managed a team who did, you know, I managed a team who did data engineering, did data science, did data visualization. We had thousands of customers. And when things went wrong, I was the, the kind of the guy who had their boss and had to help them make the trains run on time. And, you know, I, I just hated having customers call me up and say, yeah, it's nothing worse than having a very extroverted good looking VP of sales from a giant pharma company. And they say, hey, Chris, your data's wrong. And it went out to our entire 5,000 person sales team. And you know what, Chris, if you don't get it right, you know, you're fired. And so that's like not a fun task. Uh, and so I don't know if you've had that experience of just getting data wrong and kind of being yelled at by your customer. And, you know, I, we hired a bunch of uh, good people and they were all really uh, intentionally good, but people would make changes in maybe their ETL process, maybe in the model itself, maybe in the visualization. And they'd throw it in in the last minute and kind of hope it was right and wouldn't know that it was right. And they'd tell me, hey, it must be right because no one's called up and yelled at me. And so that's not a fun thing to get as a manager. 
Um, and then I just hated sort of driving into work in the morning. And I like worry that I get this email from people saying, you know, you suck, the data's wrong and these nasty emails. And it always made for an unpleasant day where I'd have to pull people together. We'd have to figure out what the problem is. It was the smartest people on the team. We'd lose a day of work just trying to trace down some error, if not more. Um, and then the domain we worked in, which, which was healthcare, um, just had a lot of data sets. We were integrating hundreds of data sets and our data providers, maybe you've had this experience, kind of don't care about you. They give you data that's a different size, shape, amount, and, and you're sort of left trying to figure out what the problem is. Um, and so, you know, I also worked for a, a company and my boss, I was the COO and he was the CEO, and he was a Harvard educated doctor. And he was, um, you know, at Harvard Medical School, they're very, you know, if you get into Harvard Medical School, you're a smart guy. And he's a pretty, re he's pretty relentless. And he'd go off and think of some new analytic insight for healthcare. And I'd work with the team and sort of translate that into how we're going to do it. And I'd go up to him and say, hey, David, we can get this done in two weeks. I'd be, and I'd be a very proud puppy. And he'd look at me and pull his glasses down and say, Chris, I thought that should take two hours and not two weeks. And so, you know, I just had a, it, it wasn't fun. And, you know, I had a data engineer. I was 24. He was 24. I was 42. He sort of came to my office during a one-on-one -on -one and cried because he just felt like he couldn't go fast enough. Things were breaking left and right. And, and so, you know, and we had hired a whole bunch of smart people. And I learned that people love their tools. Like we had a group that liked Tableau. We had another group, group that liked Click. We had some people who liked to do their data work in SQL and some people like to do visual like UIs like Informatica. And don't get me started between the people who talk about R and Python and these sort of holy wars on tools were just not um, you know, my favorite thing to go through because people love their tools and, and for good reason. And so, you know, at the end, I've been married to my wife now for over 30 years and, and you know, about 2007, 2008, she said, you know, Chris, could you just fix the problem? I'm entirely sick of hearing about you complaining. And in some ways, I've been working on these same problems for the last 15 years. And we eventually uh, built that company up and then sold it. And then my co-founders and I started Data Kitchen with, with kind of this sort of pain in mind and realizing that this was the sort of problems we had are not unique to us. And I think everyone who's been in the data field has a version of these problems. And I think the key insight that we realized is that what we do is not as important as how you do it. And in some ways, my journey as a leader goes to kind of thinking about, well, what, how did other people do this? How did manufacturing do it? And as an example, this guy, Dr. Deming, he said only 6% of the time, it's a person who creates this problem. 94% of the time, it's the system, it's the how, and you've got to build a good system. And in fact, as a leader, that's what you own. You own that. And you know you can't go sort of blaming people for making a problem, you have to fix, build a system to fix it. And so if you look at it, the problem of data ops in a broad level, it's really a lot of the sources of pain in data and analytics is that people kind of focus on the next thing. They focus on, can I tweak my visualization? Can I uh, update my model? Can I update my governance? Can I... Uh, put some new data in the data pipeline. What's the data itself? And they're always focused. I got a whole backpack of things I got, I got, I've got to do. And the perspective of that, I think, is that it ends up that most data and analytic projects fail. And you know, new tools are nice, but it's really about um, what is the root cause of this? And I think the root cause is just being excessively focused on the individual task and not really focused on kind of the how. How do you develop? How do you quickly deploy? How do you iterate something from, get ideas from your people's head and get it into production? How do you monitor and test things so that they have low errors? And how do you collaborate across all these people? And to me, these things end up, this upstream focus kind of ends up with four main things that you wanna focus on when you do data ops. The first is, you know, bad phone calls. You want low error rates, either from poor data quality or something breaking into processing or some bad work that's been done. You wanna be able to iterate quickly, um, be able to uh, deploy from a development environment to production. And you wanna measure your success and get analytic about your analytic processing. And then finally, there is, it's hard in data and analytics. People are all over the place. You have some people in central IT in the hub, some people in the spokes, you have data science teams. How do you manage that sort of organizational sprawl? 
And what we found is that a lot of companies actually aren't doing very well on this. Their cycle time is measured in weeks, not days. They're, they have errors left and right, and their customers don't trust the data. And there's a lot of Hatfields and McCoy, central IT team not liking the self-service team, and everyone doesn't like the data science team. And no one's really actually measuring how well they're doing the, in terms of error rates and cycle times. And so what we have uh, seen and worked with other companies on this is that actually is a really high cost and actually ends up being unhappy customers. And so our uh, experience in uh, people buying our product and deploying our product to do data ops is that they end up with in a better place. They end up being able to push this graphic equalizer up that they can deploy fast. Maybe they can deploy a new data visualization, a new model. They can deploy a new set of metadata about governing it, get that quickly, but they can also do that with very, very low errors. And that's really the, the push here and the disbelief a lot of people have around data ops, that you can go fast and not break things, that you can iterate quickly and not get yelled at for making mistakes. And that's, if someone's been in the field for a while, that's a tall order. And I think this focus on the system and focus on uh, not replacing your tools, but making it work is where we've seen our customers um, have success. And so the last set of stories I want to tell you are sort of our customer stories on how they've been able to accomplish this. And in some ways, these values are sort of like the motherhood and apple pie. Who wouldn't want to have less errors? Who wouldn't want to deploy faster? Who wouldn't want to have less meetings with people? Um, and so what people have to choose on their uh, data ops journey is sort of where they're going to start, what team they're going to start in. Are they going to start in with the back end database team? Are they going to start with a data science team or a BI and a governance team? And so I'm just going to give you a couple of stories. And so the first story I'm going to give is a American transportation company. And so they have vehicles. Um, the data comes in in streams. It comes in from SAP and internal systems. And they have this really kind of cool architecture where data comes in on the left, their data customers, think of them as the VPs in the organization. And um, you know, data comes in in streaming and NIFI, it comes in over Kafka, they have an enterprise service bus, they use uh, Informatica to do their ETL, they have a predictive model and all ends up in a big you know, data lake, not using uh, you know, Zoloni, but using Oracle as the data lake. And they visualize it, not in click, but in Tableau, and they have some Jupyter notebooks. And of course, like everyone, everyone they are in going to the cloud. And so the problem happens is when they were having errors, something would go wrong. And this is more common than you think. And, you know, Jane, the VP, would call up, the, call up someone in IT and say, my report is wrong. And they just didn't know where it was. What did someone misconfigure Tableau? Did an attribute of a dimension get, uh, get messed up? Um, where do you find the problem? Was it the data that was streaming and that worked wrong? Or was it the vehicles that were producing? And so they would literally have 30 people on a phone call for hours trying to figure this out, and it would take them days to find it. And that's the best people in your organization because, you know, it's a VP who's making noise. And that's just not fun. And I, I, I've learned that that's just an intolerable situation. And I, I just think having a lot of errors like that, it demoralizes the team and it takes away time to actually do good things. So one of the things we want people to focus on is just lowering your error rates. And to do that, we um, take a build a system. We don't replace any of the tools they have. What we do is sit and kind of observe the system as it's running. We'll grab bits of data. We'll uh, make sure that the data is the right size, the right shape. And in fact, we'll check the artifacts that the model ran. We'll check model compliance. We'll even check the visualization because people are putting, you know, good business code in the visualization layer and to see that it's all right. And when we find something wrong or even something weird, we'll send you an alert and we'll say, hey, you should check this out. And it's a Slack message or a Jira ticket or, or an email. Because the whole point of this is that you want to find problems before your customers do. And kind of the, the lesson here that um, you know, our, our software provides is that you should think about um, from a principle standpoint, man, don't run away from your errors, love your errors, improve them. Because in a lot of ways, this sort of quality and error focus is what made Japanese cars, in my mind, better than American cars. And I grew up in Wisconsin in the 80s and American Motors was about 10 miles from my house and they went out of business because not because 
uh, Japanese cars because Japanese cars were better because they focused on quality and error rates. And this sort of way of thinking about as making it a primary activity uh, is important. And being able to actually check your data in production, grabbing it, bits of data, and at all points of the process on top of your entire tool chain, and being able to kind of send alerts and notifications and keep track of history because you're running a factory, whether you believe it or not. And uh, an attribute of fa a good factory is it does something called statistical process control, that you look at changes over time in your control points to see if things are out of compliance. And that's something that you should do because you want to know. And finally, you should be able to make checks that look exactly the way your business user looks at it. And I don't know if you've had the pain that I've had where you kind of work for a few weeks, build the database, build a report, you throw it to the business customer, and then two seconds later they go, nice work, the data's wrong. And like, how do they know that? Well, they know it because they've got heuristics and they look at the, they've memorized their top customers and top regions, and you should compare those. You should check the, the, their business heuristics before they get it. And if you do all that work, you end up with much less errors in production. You end up having more time to innovate um, and you get more customer data trust and you build the lattice of tests that you can also use not only in production, but you can use in a development process to make sure that you haven't checked, have, haven't broken anything, that you can change things quickly. And that's kind of where another uh, people start is that they, uh, this is a global pharma company, and they had kind of a combination of, of problems. They had a development process where they, one team would make a change, and it would break another team's work. And how do you fix that? How do you make sure that, number one, even within a, a single team, they make a change? And it's complicated, like a lot of big organizations, because they had two different groups. So they had set up a a group that had an on-prem Spark cluster and, and really, you know, cool tools, sort of a best of breed uh, tool chain um, with uh, ETL tools and data science tools and really high value, very large drug discovery data. But they also have a, an Azure cloud team and they use Azure Data Lake and, and Databricks and they've got another tool to do ETL and another tool to do visualization. And, um, They've got various research data sets, but the coordination needs to happen. The work that happens in that uh, genomic data on the left needs to be work with the data that's on the right. And so you need to have these two teams that need to coordinate. And so how do you make that happen? Because especially two teams want to work independently. And so I want to make a change in, in my work here in this uh, New Jersey, but I also want to make, I want the other team to be able to make changes in California. And how do you live in that world where You've got two teams, they're independent, but the customer sees the sum of their work. And that's really um, challenging unless you sort of build a system to do that. And we've got a feature in our software that allows you to have both centralized control and decentralized control. And so uh, the main, so if I go to the end here, I think um, I've got one more minute left and I need, want to cut ahead to my last slide. And in that slide, I just want to talk about Data Kitchen. So we have some software that can help you take these stories that I've made and uh, make it real for you. Um, and so what we try to focus on is given all the tools, and you may have tools from Click or Zaloni or all the, or a lot of the other vendors out there, and we help you decrease the cycle time that you can innovate, lower error rates in production, improve collaboration, and measure your process. And so we have a software product to do that. And we've also kind of written a lot about data ops. So we wrote a book, uh, Manifesto. We're actually coming out with a second book on, on data, on enterprise data ops transformation here in the next month. Um, and if you Google data ops, you'll find the first sort of half the page on Google is sort of filled up with our content. So um, here's some resources for you to learn more about our product and also to learn more about data ops as a concept. Thank you very much, Chris. At this point in time, we're going to dive into questions from our viewers today. The first question is for Susan. Susan, can you implement data governance across hybrid environments? Absolutely, yes. And you should. <laughs> and I think hybrid is the new norm. Uh, whether hybrid means multi-cloud or on-prem and cloud or across both, um, but the answer is absolutely not only yes, but you should. Got it. Thanks for clarifying. Dan, our next question is for you. Is data ops only used for analytic pipelines? 
Uh, great question because I, I tend to take an analytic bent uh, because it, analytics is, is the most prevalent use case for moving data to the cloud and data ops as, as we see it. Uh, but it's not the only use for, uh, for data ops. Uh, it's used for things like application modernization. How do I replicate data from on-prem into the cloud in real time so that I have a, an accurate transactional representation in my cloud database? And I can take advantage of, of modern tools to build new web applications or mobile applications. Uh, using things like microservices, where I've got multiple different databases and technologies in the cloud, and I need to be able to, to move that data into the cloud quickly, uh, or B2B integration. So there's every use case where a, a consumer needs data uh, is a use case for data ops. We just see that the, that the move to the cloud and the need to be able to uh, efficiently deliver analytics-ready data for cloud warehouses, cloud lakes, is really where there's an awful lot of energy and, and focus right now, and for good reason. Understood. Thanks, Dan. Chris, our next question is for you. What would be the first data ops step to implement to make the most impact? Well, what we try to do is work with customers to figure out what lever they want to push first. Do they want to reduce errors in production, or do they want to deploy quicker, or do they want to sort of stop the – Stop the meeting craziness in Hatfield and McCoys of, of greater analytic team collaboration. And it's funny, uh, our customers are sort of evenly divided on the first step, but they all want all three. They all want to be able to have less errors in production, get their ideas into, into development quicker and work in an iterative and agile way, and stop the, uh, the collaboration nightmare. And um, really because they're focused on delivering value to their customer, and that's the that sort of idea of agility and value is what drives them forward. Got it. Thanks, Chris. Suzanne, we're circling back to you. The question is, how do you incorporate machine learning into data ops? So I'll tell you the way we do it, and it goes back to that profiling and how you handle data. So our platform where we use machine learning the most is taking some guesses on how to treat data. So for example, we know what's a credit card number. We know what's a social security number. We know what's a telephone number. So when you train your software to understand uh, what that data looks like, then you can train your software to handle it a certain way with no human intervention. Another really common use of machine learning uh, in data ops is when you're trying to master data. So you can start to train a model that, hey, if a customer is Susan Cook, S. Cook, Susan Payne Cook, uh, uh, S. Cook with an E, without an E, et cetera, et cetera, you can start to do some probable the probabilistic, I can't even say it, matching uh, it, through machine learning. So um, there's a lot of practical and pragmatic applications of machine learning in data ops, all for the purpose of automating and making things more efficient and safer. Uh, again, take the human intervention out of it, and it's, uh, and it's safer. So those are just a few examples. Understood. Thanks, Susan. Dan, our next question is for you. Who owns the data ops processes in an enterprise? <laughs> Everyone. Uh, this is one of those emerging areas that as data ops becomes uh, to the forefront of you know, the data engineering teams, uh, and CDOs, and others. It, it's really, you know, it's asking the question, who owns the data pipelines? Um, you, most people think of the data engineering team as the delivery vehicle. One of the things that, that we're seeing is, is the rising role of data product managers, right, that are sitting closer to the line of business. And they are working uh, collaboratively with the data engineering team. And oftentimes these, these product managers uh, report into the CDO or certainly have a, a dotted line to the CDO. And, you know, they're product managers, not unlike product managers in a software company, but they're focused on delivering uh, data and, and data sets to solve business business needs. So um, 
it's really a shared responsibility. But at the end of the day, data engineering owns the responsibility. They're the ones that get called, like from uh, Chris's story. You know, if the data if the data's wrong, they're the ones that are going to get the call. Um, but it really is a shared responsibility, making sure that data engineering and and the line of business and the product managers uh, are aligned uh, on the requirements and on the ultimate delivery. Understood. Chris, we're circling back to you. The question is, we are really interested in the data mesh. Would you say that data ops is complementary to the data mesh and how do you see them working together? Yeah, I, I like the idea of data mesh because it's another way that um, someone has stolen an idea from software and applied it to data and analytic systems. And you could argue in some ways data ops is like that. How do you, how do you have a team that's agile and iterative and do that in a very complicated and data and analytic world. And so the data mesh idea is, is saying, well, your people are not perfectly fungible. And so, you know, why don't we hear very much about data lakes anymore? Because what happened is, is that if you have a lake full of uh, 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 data, which is not a bad idea at all, how do you have a team who understands that data and is able to answer business questions? And they have to have some knowledge of the domain. And so a data mesh is basically saying, focus your people on certain data sets and get them expert. And then they can actually service their customer in a better way and that sort of product oriented thinking. So don't boil the ocean, group these pieces together. But it, these pieces in the mesh need to be coordinated. They need to, there's a development process that they need to be deployed and that's where data ops come in. So you can use data ops principles, I think, to build a data mesh better and to coordinate the components of a, of a data mesh. Got it. Thanks, Chris. Well, we're almost at the top of the hour. At this point in time, I'd just like to offer each of you the opportunity. What would you really like our attendees today to walk away keeping in mind? And Susan, let's start with you. Uh, sure. Data Ops is here to stay. And it's a discipline, it's a process, uh, and it's a skill that every enterprise is going to have to develop and enable. So. Hopefully, uh, you learned a lot today, and, and we're happy to help if we can. Thanks, Susan. And uh, Dan, your final thought. So I would echo what Susan said and, and also say that, you know, the move to the cloud really opens up the opportunity to rethink and re-architect existing processes. And, you know, thinking about how the data warehouse has evolved, uh, and if you if you're following that same approach you have you have had for the last decade, uh, you're not going to see the agility and success that you hope to in the movement to the cloud. So use this as an opportunity uh, to rethink those processes, and that's where data ops can really help accelerate uh, your returns on the move to the cloud. Understood. Thanks, Dan and Chris. Your final remarks. If, those, if my stories rang true, if that sort of embarrassment about errors and frustrations about slowness and the feeling that you want to not go into work that day, are, if those things ring true, the answer is data ops and, and uh, being able to build a system that can make your team successful. And so to me, data ops is really about making your data and analytic team's life not suck and make reclaiming some control. And so to me, this is a... a a way that I've found and learnings that I've had. And if you can learn from uh, other people and, and solve it, not have to repeat their pain, I think you're going to be in a better place to add more value to your uh, corporation and help them realize the value of being data driven. Once again, I'd like to thank our speakers today for their fantastic insights. C uh, Susan Cook, CEO of Zaloni, Dan Potter, VP of Product Marketing at Click, and Chris Berg, CEO of Data Kitchen. If you would like to review this presentation or send it to a colleague, you can use the same exact URL that you used for today's event. It will be archived, and you will receive an email within the next couple of days once that archive is posted. Plus, if you would like a copy of the presentation, you can download a PDF from the handouts tab on the console once this is archived. And again, just for participating in today's event, you could win this $100 Amazon gift card. The winner will be announced on May 28th. We will reach out to you via email if you are the lucky viewer. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We hope to see you again soon.